be alive. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Advocacy Online, Lecture 242. And this is Quint in Pediatric Ophthalmology Session 29. And today we have with us Dr. Ramesh Murthy, sir. And he'll be talking on strabismus and Mycena gravis and CPEO. And he will also be covering a little bit about our last uh, class's query about uh, muscle surgeries in thyroid eye disease. I request Pradeep Sharma, sir, to please introduce Ramesh Murthy, sir. So you're on mute, sir. Thank you, Ralika. So it's a real pleasure to welcome and introduce Ramesh Murthy. Uh, he is one of the stalwarts who has done his MBBS from AFMC Pune. So that's why you can see the discipline always exuding from him. He's <laughs> done his DNB from Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai, and then fellowship from LVPI Hyderabad, and later on moved on to Moorfields Eye Hospital, London, and did his FRCS from UK. He's one of the youngest person to receive the honorary FICO, currently senior consultant in Access Eye Clinic in Pune. He has his areas of interest in cataract, squint, low vision aids, and oculoplasty. His publications in national and international journals are 131. It's a huge for his age. He has given 760 oral and poster presentations in 21 countries and a recipient of 34 awards in his medical career, five from American Academy of Ophthalmology, which speaks of his monumental work. The viewer of archives, American Journal, British Journal, IOBS, OPRS, JPOS, and he's a member of American Academy of Ophthalmology, invited board member of American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, or rather American Association of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, executive committee member of Oculoplasty Association of India and Pune Ophthalmic Society. So we look forward to Dr. Mesh Murthy to tell us about the management of myasthenia gravis, CPEO, and thyroid eye disease, all three very complex problems which masquerade in various forms to any uh, PG who is dealing with strabismus. Over to Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, since you are there, sir, you can definitely add your word, pulse of wisdom uh, to my talk. Uh, sir, for thyroid, actually, I didn't know I had to prepare, so I didn't prepare everything. So we'll have a different and open session about Thank thyroid. You, uh, so, Sachi, uh, okay. I will share my screen. Slide. My screen is visible, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Let's go ahead. So, sir, today uh, we'll talk about two very interesting topics: uh, chronic progressive external obstetricia and myasthenia gravis. So, ocular myasthenia gravis is a fairly common condition. It is a chronic neuromuscular disorder where there is weakness and fatigability of the extraocular muscles. It happens because of impaired synaptic transmission because of decreased available acetylcholine receptors. There are two basic forms of the disease, the ocular and the generalized form. And the ocular form will sometimes precede the generalized form of myasthenia gravis. If you look at the history, uh, it was described as early 1672. And then in 1895, it was called by Jolly as myasthenia gravis pseudoparalytica. And in 1934, Mary Walker used pifysostigmine thinking uh, it, it is this disease is similar to curare poisoning and it was called as a miracle of St. Alphages. So this affects all the ages. There's no gender, no race, no geographic predilection. It is a disease of the younger women and the older men. So women mean age of onset is 28 years and for men it is about 42 years. If you look at ocular myasthenia gravis, it is more in men, more than 40 years. But the generalized myasthenia gravis has an earlier onset and more in females. Overall, if you see myasthenia gravis, the female to male ratio is 3 to 2. If you look at the prevalence, different studies have put a different uh, values for this, but uh, on an average, it is about 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 50,000, more in the Chinese, and there are different HLA associations with A1, B8, C7, DR3, and DQW2. And it's very important to remember that 50% of the ocular myasthenia gravis will develop generalized myasthenia gravis. So this has a very important clinical uh, significance. So what is the pathogenesis? It is anti-acylcholine receptor antibodies which are causing the problem. And in generalized mycin, it is present about 99% of the cases. And in ocular mycin, in about 40 to 77% of the cases. So these uh, antibodies will decrease the available acetylcholine receptors. They will cause receptor blockade or complicated mediated damage, or they accelerate the receptor degradation. So the acetylcholine receptor's life is one day in mycinics. But on average, the acetylcholine receptor will last for about 7 to 11 days. 
the extracellular muscles are obviously more susceptible this to this problem. About 65 to 75 percent of the patients will have thymic hyperplasia. So there is infiltration with the lymphocytes and plasma cells and the presence of lymphoid follicles. About 5 to 20 percent of the patients will have thymoma, and this will in, this incidence is going to increase with age. And about one third to one half of the patients of thymoma have my have myasthenia. Now, why does this thymic uh, uh, condition come in? Because they have these uh, striped muscle antibodies which can cause this problem. So if you have a patient with thymoma, they're more likely to have a severe presentation. So let's look at the clinical features. The hallmark is a variable muscle weakness, which is relieved by rest. It is exacerbated by repetitive muscle contraction. It is more following physical exertion or towards the evening. It affects predominantly the striated muscles like the diaphragm, the limb, and the bulbar musculature. And the extraocular muscles are more susceptible. So if you have a patient who presents with bilateral ptosis, weak eye closure, and ophthalmoparesis, then it is most likely a case of myasthenia. So let us look at this video. So this patient, as you can see, is having difficulty in uh, ductions and versions. And he's also got severe ptosis on the right side. And what I've done is I've done an eyes test on him. And you can see here that the eyes open very big and he's also going to give us a little smile that he's happy that the eye opened just with an eyes. So we actually did an eyes test to prove that it's myasthenia. This is a classic myasthenia where with fatigue, the eye is going to close. <coughs> so the eyelid shows variable and fatigable ptosis. It is usually asymmetric. Unilateral will eventually become bilateral. It is absent on waking up. So the test that we do is a lid fatigue test. So we ask the patient to look at up gaze for a long time. And this <coughs> dose is going to increase. <coughs> Sorry. The second is a Kogan lid twitch sign. So when the patient looks from down gaze to primary position, the lid is going to shoot up a little bit and then come down or a lid quiver. This is again a feature of Mycena gravis. Now extracular muscle involvement. 90% of the diplopia is going to occur due to the paresis, and usually extracular muscle involvement is going to be associated with ptosis and does not occur in isolation. There is a va <coughs> variable incomitant strabismus. It is usually the medial rectus and the superior rectus actions which are more involved. It can mimic any pupil sparing ocular motility disorder. Sometimes the term pseudo intranuclear ophthalmoplegia is also given when there is unilateral or bilateral adduction weakness with occasional dissociated nystagmus of the abducting eye. Sometimes saccadic movements seem to be more faster than normal in these cases. Two more tests which have been described is the orbicularis peak test. So what happens is that the orbicularis is weak and if you ask the patient to close the lids tightly, it is very easy to open the lids in a myasthenia patient as compared to a normal patient. Lid hopping can also be noted. So small amplitude movements of the lid can occur on lateral gaze, which you may see in the subsequent video. So this particular patient, you can see small lid hopping movements going to happen when he looks on lateral gaze. So this patient is trying to ma maintain open eyelids, but the eyelid is eventually falling, as you can see on the right side, and there is development of ptosis. So this is a case of classic myasthenia involving the ocular uh, structures. So the key to diagnosis is variable incompetent strabismus with or without ptosis, and the pupil is normal. That is a very important feature. So there are different patterns of ocular motility impairment which may be seen. So you, it might mimic a sixth nerve palsy or a third nerve palsy or a fourth nerve or a Brown syndrome or even intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, depending on the type of condition. Sometimes even other conditions like progressive supranuclear palsy, horizontal gaze palsy, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia or one and a half syndrome. So these are the mimics that it can be present like. So we should have a high degree of suspicion of myasthenia in the back of our mind. So when should we have a high index of suspicion? If there is ptosis, diplopia, weak lid closure, facial or limb weakness, variability or fatigability. In the history, patient may give history of intermittent diplopia and ptosis. Sometimes there could be family history of Graves disease or rheumatoid arthritis. So when we evaluate the patient, we look at the ptosis, whether it is variable, the head posture, the kind of strabismus he may have, which may be variable. We do a cover-uncover test, look at the ocular movements, Look for ARC, visual fields, nystagmus. Variability in fatigability is present at different times of the day and on prolonged eccentric gaze. 
So there are various tests that we can do uh, in the uh, in the uh, OPD to diagnose a case. So ice pack test is one of the most interesting and useful tests where the ice pack is placed over the closed lids for two to five minutes. But this is going to work only for the ptosis. It is uh, more specific about 98% and about 76% sensitive. So when we place the eyes, uh, the degradation of the esterase is going to take a longer time and therefore the acetyl choline will last for a longer time. Am I audible? Yeah, uh, I think so. This video is stuck. Pradeep sir, am I audible clearly? Yeah, yeah, uh, you are audible. But I think we are not uh, getting. Yes, sir. I will just communicate to uh, Ramesh sir. Okay, I think he's rejoining. Yes, sir. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, uh, sir. Screen is yet to be shared, yeah. sir. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Come. Yeah. Yes. So the other test that we can do is a repetitive nerve stimulation and the single fiber EMG in which a needle electrode is placed in the muscle and we can uh, assess the uh, presence of myasthenia. So let us talk a little bit in more detail about the tests. So immunological testing can be for the presence of elevated acetylcholine receptor antibodies. And these are present in about 87% of patients with generalized myasthenia and about 50 to 80% of cases of ocular myasthenia. So the tests are for the binding antibodies, the modulating antibodies, and the blocking antibodies. The positive predictive value is high, which means a positive test, it is diagnostic. But having a negative test does not rule out myasthenia. Other antibodies which you test are the musk antibodies or the muscle-specific kinase antibodies. These are usually... Uh, more positive in the females and there is presence of oculobulbar weakness. Sometimes patient may be acetylcholine receptor antibody negative but musk positive. Sometimes they may be negative for both the antibodies when it is called a seronegative myasthenia gravis. Anti-striated muscle antibodies could also be present especially in patients with thymoma and that is how the thymic hyperplasia affects and creates myasthenia. CT chest is a useful test the thymus usually involutes before adulthood, but in myasthenia gravis, thymic hyperplasia would be present in about 70% of cases and thymomine 10% of the cases. Thyroid tests are also useful because 13% of the myasthenia gravis patients are going to have thyroid dysfunction. The TH17 lineage is common to both thyroid-associated orbitopathy and myasthenia gravis. If there is thyroid-associated ophthalmopathy with exotropia, myasthenia gravis is more possible. So one more session of myasthenia gravis that is with thyroid eye disease. The endrophonium test uh, competitively inhibits the acetylcholine esterase. So more of acetylcholine is available. Usually we give 10 milligram per ml IV. The onset is in 30 to 60 seconds and lasts for 5 to 10 minutes. This is unfortunately not very easily available anymore. In, when you do this test like endrophonium or the neostigmine test, we always document the ptosis, the position and the ocular motility defect and then we give this injection. So endrophonium, we always start with a very low dose and then we give the higher dose. The side effects include increased muscarinic activity in the form of lacrimation, salivation, sweating, abdominal cramps, and other serious problems like bradycardia, synco, bronchospasm, or hypotension can also occur. So always we do this test in a proper setup where there is access to a proper monitoring and an anesthetist is available. So we monitor the BP, the pulse, the ECG, and the antidote for this is atropine. It is definitely contraindicated in patients with bronchial asthma and cardiac issues, but the sensitivity of this test is about 90% for ocular myasthenia gravis. Neostigmine is a good alternative to this, but uh, the duration in which we need to observe the patient is about 30 minutes. And usually we give about 1.5 milligrams IM into the deltoid muscle. What are the important differential diagnosis? The first differential diagnosis is chronic progressive external oxaliplegia, which we're going to discuss subsequently. So I'll just skip it for this for now. The second is the internuclear ophthalmoplegia. So in this condition, there is adduction weakness in one eye and in the other eye, there is abducting nystagmus. And usually there is a lesion at the right MLF. <coughs> the second differential diagnosis is skew deviation, which is a vertical misalignment of the eyes. Usually it is a comitant in nature and it is usually a supranuclear problem. <coughs> but it is a different pattern which is maintained. It does not change. 
And the third is ocular neuromyotonia, in which there is paroxysmal spasms of the extraocular muscles of different muscles at different times. So this may also mimic a mycena gravis. So how do we manage the patients? We first do investigations. We do a blood workup. We do thyroid uh, tests. We do anti-nuclear antibodies, ESR, and we do a CT chest for the mediastinal masses. What is the goal of treatment? The goal of treatment is to try to prevent progression to generalized myasthenia. To prevent myasthenic crisis, we want to improve the quality of life of the patient by getting rid of the ptosis and the diplopia. And we also want to have a disease remission. So the management could be both medical as well as surgical. Medical is the mainstay of treatment. So we use acetylcholine esterase inhibitors in these. This gives symptomatic relief. So the drug of choice is pyridostigmine bromide, 60 milligrams, starting with three times a day. The onset of action is about 30 minutes after ingestion. The peak action is one to two hours and the duration is for about four hours. 50% of the patients are going to respond to this. Some side effects which patients may experience is abdominal cramps and diarrhea for which we can give one milligrams of glycopyrrolate. Alternative to pyrostigmine is neostigmine and ambinonium. In addition, we can also think of immunotherapy. To get a rapid response, we can give steroids, plasma pheresis, or human gamma globulin. And we can think for remission, we can think of azathioprine and thymectomy. We always try to repeat the acetylcholine receptor antibody titers every six months and look at the clinical response. Suppose we've started the patient on pyridostigmine and we've given about two to four weeks of pyridostigmine. And if it fails, then we can definitely go to the next step that is to give oral immunosuppressive therapy in the form of steroids. So steroids has its own side effects and sometimes it may also fail, in which we go on to the next drug of choice, which is mycophenolate mefotil. mefotil. It has minimal side effects, though the cost is more. And usually we give about 1000 milligrams twice a day, but the effect is going to come a little late in onset, about two months or so after we start the medicine. Other drugs which can be used is cyclosporin, cyclophosphamide, and even azathioprine. So if mycophenolate is not working, then we can go for azathioprine. And then we have the other drugs also like tacrolimus, etc. Very promising drugs are the acilizumab and the rituximab. However, they have a high cost, but they have ease of use. <clears throat> now, other management would be use of prisms or occlusion therapy if there is a very disconcerting diplopia. Surgery is done in very selected cases with uh, great caution. If the ocular motility defect is chronic and non-progressive for 6 to 12 months, there is a large angle of deviation, poor response to medical therapy, then we might think of uh, any kind of squint surgery. We always evaluate the patient again and again every three months before we take such a decision. And we always do the surgery on adjustable sutures to get a better result. So this is a very interesting patient who suffered from myasthenia for at least three to four years. And he uh, subsequently, he developed this kind of vertical strabismus. And then uh, we did uh, surgery on the inferior rectus and the superior rectus muscles on the left eye and some surgery on the right eye also to get the eye in position. As you can see, the right eye inferior rectus muscle was recessed. So the eyes actually, the lower lid is sagged down a little bit on the right side to get the eye in a more acceptable uh, position in primary gaze. So we have to resort to such kind of surgeries occasionally in case of mycena gravis patients. So that is the first part of my lecture uh, about myasthenic gravis. Now, uh, Rudika, can we go on to the next part, chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And maybe we can have questions at the end. Yeah, questions are taken the end, so no problem. Sir. So the next part is the chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, which is again a very interesting uh, case study where we see these patients occasionally in the OPD. So this presents with bilateral ptosis and reduction in ocular motility. So when we say chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, we are talking about a descriptive clinical finding rather than a diagnosis. This is a classic mitochondrial myopathy. So CPO can occur in isolation or it could be CPO plus when other features of mitochondrial dysfunction are present, that is more of systemic features. So again, this was described as early as 1868. And in 1958, it was Kearns and Sairi who and recognized the association of progressive external ophthalmoplegia with the retinal degeneration and heart block. And in 1968, Drachman uh, added ophthalmoplegia to it. And he named it as ophthalmoplegia plus. So the prevalence of mitochondrial disease as such is about 11.5 cases per 1 lakh population. This condition has got equal incidence in both males and females. And the age of onset is usually less than 20 years. 
So what happens? What is the pathophysiology? So what happens is mitochondrial dysfunction leads to impaired protein synthesis. So this accumulation of these enlarged mitochondria below the sarcolemma, which are seen in these red ragged fibers. So the clinical features, this can affect any age. There could be bilateral ptosis, bilateral ophthalmoparesis. The ptosis could be prior or simultaneous. Usually this is a progressive and symmetric condition, but that is not the rule. There could be poor function of the levator papillary superioris. Diplopia could be present in about 20 to 40 percent, though generally people say there's no diplopia, but occasionally we do see patients with diplopia. Horizontal diplopia is more common and exotropia is more common in about 90 percent of cases. There is significant visual disability because of this condition and driving at night especially is extremely difficult. So if you look at this particular patient, you can see that he's having bilateral severe ptosis and you can see the nine gazes hardly any movement of the eyes. And you can see that he's put a small tape uh, onto his forehead to lift up his lids. So he's actually using some kind of crutch to open his lids. <coughs> this is a much younger patient who has started developing PEO. And you can see here that his eye movements are limited in all directions. And he has the beginning of ptosis in both the eyes, though it is not uh, remarkable. But you can see that <coughs> his eye hardly moves in any direction of case. One more patient who has, uh, you can see, it is not uh, very symmetric. There is a large angle exotropia. His toes is again not symmetric. It is very variable. And one might think it is some kind of neurological problem like a third nerve palsy. But actually, uh, it is a case of chronic progressive external obstinal plagia. So sometimes you could have neurological abnormalities like cerebral ataxia, pendular nystagmus, or vestibular dysfunction and or hearing loss. One may also have endocrine dysfunction like short stature, hypoparathyroidism, diabetes, gonadal dysfunction, or hyperaldosteronism. So this is the rule of P's of chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. It is painless, progressive, pupil sparing. There is presence of ptosis. Usually there is no diplopia. <coughs> Paralysis or ophthalmoplegia is present. It is a mitochondrial problem. So there is oxidative phosphorylation dysfunction. It is usually caused, caused by POLG or twinkle gene mutations. And pigmentary retinopathy could be a feature of kern iris syndrome. So CPO follows the rule of peace. <coughs> <coughs> so the differential diagnosis. Ocular myasthenia is the first differential diagnosis. So the diplopia in chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia is stereotypical. So the diplopia pattern is always the same, unlike in myasthenia, in which the diplopia pattern will be different at different time periods. The second differential diagnosis is the sagging eye syndrome, which is commonly seen in case of high myopes, where the intramuscular bands between the lateral rectus and the superior rectus are going to become weak. And therefore, there's a displacement of the superior rectus and the lateral rectus. So in these cases of sagging eye syndrome, the eye will assume a position of esotropia. So there is impaired up gaze, distance esotropia, normal saccadic velocity, binocular diplopia, but the adduction and depression are usually full. Wernicke's encephalopathy occurs because of thymine deficiency and poor nutrition and could be also considered as a differential diagnosis. Thyroid eye disease is again a differential diagnosis, but it, of course there is lid retraction, which is a very classic feature, and of course inflammation of the orbit and the eyes. Myocyte is again, but in this case, again, there is a lot of inflammation. Progressive supranuclear palsy <laughs> affects predominantly the vertical eye movements. Miller-Fisher syndrome, which can be seen associated with, uh, as, as a part of guillain barre syndrome. There is ataxia, areflexia, diffuse ophthalmoplegia. Usually it has acute onset and there is presence of anti-GQ1B antibodies. Congenital fibrosis of the extraocular muscles is also a differential diagnosis, but usually it is present from birth. There is non-progressive ptosis and ophthalmoparesis. So these are the differential diagnoses of chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. So the diagnosis is predominantly clinical based on our evaluation of the ptosis and the eye movements. But imaging findings are also useful. On CT scan, we can see diffuse extracular muscle atrophy. <clears throat> and on the MRI scan, we must see the spongiform signal on T1 in the extracular muscle bellies. So spongiform means it's more like a porous consistency. Sometimes in the blood, we could have elevated lactate 
in the CSV, we could have elite lactate. But again, it is non specific. The genetic testing is very useful because this is a mitochondrial disease. Now, 50% of cases are sporadic. There is a single mitochondrial DNA deletion. 50% of the cases are autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, or maternal transmission, in which mutation of the POLG1 gene is the most common. Autosomal recessive CPO is less common. So this disease is about 50% sporadic, 50% proper genetic transmission. Now, muscle biopsy is a very interesting part of this disease, which helps in confirming the diagnosis. If you get a piece of the extraocular muscles during squint surgery or the levator muscle during stosis surgery, even that might show the features of the muscle biopsy. So when there is accumulation of the mitochondrial DNA, the mitochondria are going to stain red with gomori trichrome stain, which is called as a red ragged fibers, which you can see in the picture on the extreme right. And there could be increased expression of succinate dehydrogenase, that is a ragged blue fibers with this picture on the middle. And therefore, could be deficient staining for cytochrome oxidase, or they're called Cox negative. We can see in the picture with the brown colored stains and the empty uh, areas where there's a small arrow. So this muscle biopsy for the red ragged fibers is considered to be very diagnostic of chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. So when you look at the spectrum of this condition, there are different kinds of syndromes which have been described. So the most commonly described is the pigmentary retinopathy or the kern sire syndrome, which is a salt and pepper kind of retinopathy, usually in the macular area, sometimes in the equator and the peripapillary area. So there could be speckled clumps of retinal pigment epithelium, However, the vision is very good in these cases with normal fields and the ERG is not at all specific. In addition, you could have CPEO plus where there is neurological involvement like dementia, Parkinsonism, ataxia, seizures, Pearson syndrome where there is bone marrow and pancreatic insufficiency, Perrault syndrome with hypogonadism, Alpha syndrome with hepatic failure, Sando with sensory ataxia, dysarthria and neuropathy, Melas with mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke. <clears throat> so, kern sire syndrome is very typical, usually presents very early in life, less than 20 years of age. There could also be cardiac conduction defects, which is very important to note. So, cardiac issues can give rise to sudden death. So, it's very important to evaluate these patients and get their 2D codes done. Sometimes, they could have cerebral ataxia as well. Oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy usually occurs after the age of 40 years. It occurs usually in patients of French Canadian descent. There is autosomal dominance and there is swallowing difficulty, ptosis, and external ophthalmoplegia. Myotonic dystrophy presents with frontal baldness, testicular atrophy, cardiac issues like cardiomyopathy and conduction defects. Patients are noted to have a hatchet like face or a narrow jaw. There could be chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, lens changes, and slow saccades. <clears throat> This we already covered uh, about CPO plus, where there's weakness of the limb and facial muscles. Dominant optic atrophy could also be present as one of the associations. And most of these have got the POLG gene mutation. So how do we manage these cases? So systemically, we have to manage the symptoms at the organ level. So if there is a cardiac problem, we are thinking about problems like arrhythmia, cardiomyopathy, which can give rise to sudden cardiac death. So we need to do an ECG echocardiogram and evaluate the patient. Patient may have endocrinopathies like diabetes mellitus, hypothyroidism, hypoparathyroidism, adrenal failure. So they need to be seen by the endocrinologist. Patient may have sensorineural hearing loss and so they need an audiology to be done, testing. <clears throat> Patient may also occasionally have dysphagia. So there is usually cricopharyngeal echalasia. So they usually do an video fluoroscopy and they cut off the cricopharynx. But we need to treat the eye manifestation because those are the patients who will come to us. The ophthalmoplegia many of times is asymptomatic. The patient is more worried about the ptosis. Why is he worried about the ptosis? Because it is causing visual obstruction. So he always has to keep a chin up position. Patient may like to use crutch glasses or they may like to use taping as I showed in my patient. Surgery is the mainstay of treatment <coughs> or the final treatment. But we have to perform surgery with great caution. If there is mild, <coughs> sorry. If there is mild levator impairment, we can go for resection or advancement. If there's advanced levator weakness, we can go for frontalis suspension. But the most important thing is to assess the belts phenomenon because most of these patients are going to have poor belts. We need a lot of lubricants. And unless we are very sure about the problem of exposure keratitis not happening, we should not easily proceed for surgery. 
always we should do a dilated retinal examination because we want to look for other associations or salt and pepper retinopathy, cranial nerve testing to look for neurological problems and forced duction testing to look at the muscle strength and the muscle uh, tightness. Patient may have binocular diplopia, in which case we use prisms. The problem in chronic progressive external ophthalmic is poor fusion amplitude, so prisms or even surgery may not give us a desired or the successful outcome. So strabismus surgery, we can, if there is FDT is positive, we can think of recessions. Interoperative, we find that the muscle is very flaccid, then maybe recession will not work. So patient selection becomes very crucial. We are not able to completely cover or completely cure the squint. We may be able to reduce the problem so that it gets uh, treated by prisms or relieved by prisms. So if the patient is having diplopia, it is not an easy thing to treat. And again, surgery has to be done with great caution and advise the patient properly about the pros and cons. So, again, um, we've lost his Yes, contact. sir, I believe so. So I believe he'll log in back again. We'll just wait for a few seconds. I'll just try calling some. Yeah, I think you may not be aware that. You... Uh, I guess you got disconnected, sir. Um, just wait for some two minutes. I'll just call him back. So till then, is it okay if I can take a few questions yeah. to you, sir? Okay, sir. So in a classic teaching, a uh, pupil is never involved in myasthenia. So sure. does this always hold true and why, sir? I think clinically, we have uh, normally not seen a pupil involvement in either of the CPEOs or myasthenia gravis cases. Although there is an odd report which has mentioned that in the myasthenia gravis, the pupil involvement was there. So that's one case report which is there, which may be uh, questionable also. But yes, that is what we have. But generally, I have never seen a pupillary involvement in any case of myasthenia gravis or of a CPEO. So both these conditions that way are uh, pupil sparing. So one has to keep that in mind. Right, so. And uh, another question is that, so in what percent of cases of ocular myasthenia do we encounter a generalized myasthenia gravis and vice versa? Yeah, I think as uh, very succinctly Dr. Uh, Ramesh Murthy was covering and he had mentioned that ocular myasthenia gravis is uh, going to be seen in uh, the uh, older men mostly. And the women right, get so. have more of generalized myasthenia gravis. 50% of the ocular myasthenia gravis over a period of time may have a generalized myasthenia gravis. So uh, ocular myasthenia gravis is the one which we may get more often and mm -hmm. uh, usually going to be presenting to us in the form of ptosis or uh, more commonly ptosis, but sometimes it may have also associated uh, diplopia problem because of uh, adduction deficiency or other muscles and other features which we should look forward is like myasthenic sneer they are having difficulty in smiling so people who have that may have facial weakness so they have a myasthenic sneer which may be there dysarthria swallowing these are the other muscles which are involved <coughs> yeah. so that history should be taken in uh, people who may be suspected to be having myasthenia gravis uh, fatigability is something which is very commonly going to be asked in the history. And the other thing is the 
enhancement of the ptosis as has been described that when you uh, lift the lid on the other side the ptosis worsens on uh, the contralateral side so this is right. because of a herring's reflex that has been described that enhancement of ptosis which may be seen in this uh, there is also a kogan's lid twitch sign which we should be looking for the peak sign i think he described the orbicularis peak sign which is because of a eyelid inability to close fully so uh, i mean these uh, people have uh, weakness of the orbicularis muscles also in addition to the lps so ptosis is there but the closure also is a problem so right. that is right sir so one of the questions is that in uh, in all the cases that are presenting to you with an element of eso and exo and ptosis uh, by the age group of 60 or so do you do neo stigmine test for all the patients as a protocol or you um, like avoid that and go ahead with muscle surgery uh no no we do not jump to muscle surgery obviously we have to investigate them first of all what we do is the i spec test i think that is the most uh, uh, easily accessible you can do it in your clinic and it reduces i mean deduces the answer very clearly 70 to 80% may be diagnosed on the basis of an eye spec test which is just 2 minutes of your time uh, right. you also give the rest test that means uh, see that or even the history that whenever the person is sleeping gets up he's better off and mm. he's worse off in the evenings so that's another situation which may help you before you do and then the blood test the achr uh, receptor antibody which is very commonly seen like mm. a positive so 80% of the cases i think broadly there are other uh, antibodies which we can look forward to like anti musk but yes. generally in the omg oclomastinia gravis the anti musk is usually not that positive so right. the general mastinia gravis you can do an anti musk test well. <clears throat> there are some others which have been described but that's more for the pgs that we may talk for theoretical theoretical point like uh, mm. the anti lrp4 and the anti titin being used as biomarkers right so this test we will do another test which we need to do is the imaging to find out the thymus hyperplasia or thymo mom which may be there in 70 to 80% of these cases mm. so this test would be probably first done before we think about doing a surgery follow up these cases if you find that there is a change which is happening mm. uh, mastinia gravis are known to be masqueraders and the interesting thing is that on the next follow up they present in a different avatar a different form <laughs> that takes away i mean initially it was recorded as a sixth nerve or esotropia and then you get the next time is an exotropia or something else so they are like bahurupia or different uh, presentation absolutely that is one sign that it may be a mastinia gravis on the, right. other, the cpos are worsening they have the same form very slowly progressive and uh, that would be there i think dr ramesh murthy is back is he connected right so yeah he is he is about to connect so that is an uh, interesting thing that we should see and finally yes. after uh, three to six months of follow up if we find that there is no improvement which is happening then mm. we can do even a therapeutic trial can be given in cases in which you have a suspicion of it being right. a right and yes. if that you repeat the test after 6 to 12 months even mm. in negative zero negative cases Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Because of heavy rains. Oh, I know. Suddenly, no, we got no disconnected. No problem, sir. No problem. Yeah, even the last slide, I was. It was the last slide. Okay. And the last two slides, I just finished. Sorry. Yeah, please do. Uh, so, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Just make it. Uh, so, the last slide was about summary that we should have a timely diagnosis because we are not talking only about eye So thank you very much, uh, sir. Uh, as I told you, sir, we don't have any slides on thyroid, so maybe you can sir, lead the discussion and we can discuss. Yeah, good. So no you can just put on that question once again if he has anything uh, more to add to it. If there are any of the questions, sure, sir. So actually, if you would like, then I can cover the questions of myxoma gravis and CPO, and then we can uh, proceed with the thyroid eye disease correct. brief discussion. Correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we just uh, asked and discussed with the uh, uh, Dr. Radeep Sharma, sir, about uh, the importance of neostigmine test in all the patients who are presenting with squint as well as ptosis in the age range of sixty and above. So uh, we were having a discussion about the same. Uh, what would be your take on the same, sir? 
but definitely uh, to confirm the diagnosis sometimes we have to do this test uh, though sometimes we do depend on the acetylcholine receptor antibody testing also which also is supposed to be very uh, positive predictor uh, about this particular disease uh, but if you do the test we should do it in the proper setup and uh, we have to do it in the hospital setup carefully uh, under supervision of the anesthetist right so um another question sir is that uh, when we clinically suspect uh, uh, like sorry this question has been actually answered by sir already so in a patient with the uh, ocular myasthenia gravis when we have coexistent features like thyroid disease presenting with ocular deviation and if fdt is weakly positive how do we ascertain the cause and what should be our approach like all the elements are together so myasthenia gravis along with thyroid eye disease with ocular deviation and fdt is weakly positive sharma sir you give your advice then i so if both can be coexisting as dr amish had mentioned they can be uh, co travelers and uh, as he mentioned the th17 which may be having an association of both and because both are having an autoimmune uh, disease uh, background so what we would have to see if there is a fdt which is weakly positive and um, is there any ptosis or not because that would be one differentiating feature in usually the thyroid uh, cases there would be a little retraction uh, whereas uh, in the uh, myasthenia gravis the ptosis would be the uh, more important feature if both are there then we have to see an imaging may also help and of course the blood test for the uh, both the thyroid would be there but as you can see that there may be u thyroid at the time of the thyroid eye disease problem uh, though those tests may not be positive but the anti uh, cholinesterase uh, achr receptor antibodies and the anti musk antibodies should be looked into so those would be the differentiating features uh, both conditions may respond to steroids by the way because both are autoimmune but you need to distinguish them by doing imaging that may help you in such situation the blood tests and the clinical test to differentiate a lid retraction versus a ptosis which will be there so me sir what would be your uh, approach to it sir so would be as i said uh, we have to look at all the clinical signs and all the picture completely thyroid always has some signs of inflammation also so that is a very clinching feature of thyroid eye disease Mm -hmm. apart from uh, this so they can coexist many times and uh, many times we resort to doing antibody testing for thyroid antibodies and also for the uh, acetylcholine receptor antibodies to get to a diagnosis right so um so another question is that in a patient presenting with cpo like maybe as a part of cancer a uh, hooking of uh, the muscles can induce an ocular cardiac reflex what precautionary measures would uh, you consider in these subset of patients so madam if you are doing uh, any kind of squint surgery on a patient with cpo so we should do it under local anesthesia local block that is usually peribulbar block so peribulbar block itself is quite protective but always we have uh, we usually give uh, during the before the surgery we give a little bit of glycopyrrolate to the patient okay. we don't give atropine normally here but we give glycopyrrolate and this really helps in preventing any kind of uh, ocular cardiac reflex so like we really have is we have to have uh, the anesthetist ready and the atropine ready okay. and all the surgery is done under monitoring with the uh, monitor so we have a multi para monitor we are monitoring the the cardiac status we are monitoring the blood pressure we are monitoring the pulse okay so, so even if we are going uh, otherwise we may lose you again if your net connectivity just stop sharing so that your bandwidth is only showing you sorry So, like, sir, if we even if we are doing a bilateral uh, frontalis sling in these patients, like for safety enhancement, even then you would prefer to do it under local anesthesia because we are avoiding the whole ocular cardiac reflex component. I think frontalis may not induce uh, frontalis sling may not induce ocular cardiac reflex. I don't think so. But generally, we try to prefer and do the surgery under local anesthesia if it is possible. But always with the anesthetic backup. right so okay so uh, another question is that um, like uh, what histological level 
of the muscle uh, will show the red ragged appearance like at what level of depth is the biopsy required to be taken i think you take a good uh, depth of the muscle initially this the uh, muscle should come in entirety i don't think there is any depth as such but you should be take a good deep biopsy of the muscle to get the red ragged fibers firstly sharma sir may be able to tell uh, no, i think what you're saying is right only thing is that you have to go a little more away from the tendon part so you have to so it should be beyond the, the tendinous bed. part which may be 5 to 7 mm so uh, that's one thing that you have to be careful when you are doing even when you are doing resection you may not be doing that much resection but you have to take a, a biopsy from a little more uh, proximal part so that may be a situation in resections you may also again have to take a biopsy from a little more proximal part even though you are not cutting the muscle right so uh, so this is specifically for the post graduates to understand the uh, like the clinical aspect so in cpo patients of which they complain of diplopia so what are the uh, counseling segments that you would like the post graduate or any of the consultants to mention to the patient to be you know to, so that they take care of cpo with diplopia for general so day uh, so what happens cpo is that occasionally about 20 30% patients will have diplopia so usually it is a horizontal strabismus there is exotropia so patient in exotropia if it is a very large angle exotropia patient is not very bothered in his day to day activities but if it is the initial stage then he usually sees double and it becomes a problem so we advise the patient that they can uh, try occlusion of one of their eyes so it could be a glass which is slightly frosted or he can put uh, some kind of film on the inside so he can do his routine activities so occlusion is what is the best option for the patient surgery we usually defer for some time we watch carefully and it is always a slow and steady uh, observation of the disease and as the disease progresses and the patient is more receptive and we feel that uh, patient is going to benefit we go ahead with surgery because this is a progressive disease eventually the squint may come back so we always wait and watch and then do surgery very slowly and progressively right so um and sir another question is that what will be the pre operative assessments that in a general anesthesia that will be required for a patient undergoing uh, A, a general anesthesia surgery in CPO patients. So what we do in CPO patients is we make sure that we do a proper assessment. The major problem that we face is the cardiac problems. So this is it is not obvious when we look at the patient in the OPD. So invariably we ask the patient to consult a cardiologist and get all the tests done in that aspect. We ask the patient to see a good physician and make sure that they have no other endocrine problems. Because if you are doing any kind of surgery and you can't have any kind of uh, you know problems on table or any kind of surprise on the table so proper evaluation is a must apart from the routine blood test that we do a proper cardiac evaluation is a must and possibly also an endocrinologist okay sir so like a, a 2d echo and as well as an endocrinology fitness that would be required for the yes. surgery for the surgery right right sir so uh, is there any physiological difference between the extraocular muscles and the skeletal muscle in the Uh, in the patients with CPO, I know the the extraocular muscles are very are also like striated muscles only actually. Right. I don't think there's any major difference, but I can't remember anything about the histology now. I don't know. Sharma, I can't so I comment on this. The, I can't remember yeah. much. Yeah, I think the the postgraduate will need to. uh i focus more on the clinical question i have another clinical questions asked by one of the post graduates from southern um, india that is in clinical practice how often do we encounter a recurrence of squint in these subset of patients post surgery like is it similar to any other form of squint surgery i think this question is for cpo patients specifically so in cpo patients we have to understand that the squint may not be cured completely unlike uh, many other uh, committent squints like committent esotropias or committent exotropias where we might get very good results and uh, success very good uh, in terms of ocular alignment after surgery in cpo patients we cannot expect that kind of alignment <coughs> also because they have poor fusional amplitudes the fusion is quite weak so we can only say that we can kind of reduce their squint or possibly cure them for a short period and the chance of recurrence is always present in these cases so recurrence may occur Especially because the fusion is quite weak. Okay, so 
So Pradeep Sharma sir, would you like to comment on the same question? Yeah, so I think as Ramesh has said, because these muscles are lax, then even the resection will not be able to get the correction. So more than recurrences, actually it's a residual problem which remains. So whatever you do is less. You may have to do large recessions in order to get that effect because the length tension curves cannot be easily changed if the muscle laxity is there on both the sides. Mm -hmm. So that is one issue which is usually uh, bothering that they will not be fully corrected. The other issue is that they do have a ptosis which is there, which again is not going to be corrected uh, by even surgically. So many a times they have to use crutch classes. Uh, if, since they have even the weakness of the bells, so even the ptosis surgery would be little difficult to handle. So even the, I mean, a sling would not be possible. So you may have to use crutches only for the uh, ptosis problem. So that is a real issue. But yes, surgery can be done in these cases. Diplopia, fortunately, is less common because it's a chronic problem. It's a slowly uh, progressive uh, problem. So usually they get used to the diplopia over a period of time. So that's usually not there. Okay, sir. So, so you would prefer uh, that in CPO patients, we would rather do, uh, we would rather use crutch classes than going for uh, uh, a trans, uh, transfrontalis thing, sir. Definitely, we prefer crutch condition. classes. Definitely, we always prefer crutch classes or any okay. other easy method than going for surgery because the yes, is poor and uh, chance of exposure current is very high. Right. Right, sir. Uh, so there is a question that is based on the previous discussion of uh, ice pack test, as Pradeep Sharma sir mentioned. So do you think that the ptosis element, the ptosis element in, uh, decreases with ice pack, but does the squint also improve? No. So this is something that the postgraduates have a confusion about, and it's uh, best that they oh, are clear that yes, sir. And so could no, you please tell them the that, correct uh, thing? So the ice pack test. Uh, uh, it's predominantly done for the process component because that is what we can observe. It is unlikely to affect the extraocular muscles sir, or their action. Sir, your voice was breaking. Minutes, but... that, sir? Okay, sorry. I think so what usually we say about? that... Yeah, carry on. So usually we say keep the ice pack for uh, at least two minutes, but it's very difficult for the patient to sustain for such a long time. So we keep the ice pack for a couple of seconds and when the patient says it's not intolerable, then we remove the ice pack. We have already measured the ptosis and at least two millimeters or, or more excursion of the lid or uh, lift of the lid indicates that the ice pack test is positive. Uh, and it's predominantly for the ptosis component. I don't think we can assess the extra muscle component of the ice pack test. Yeah, it's a Sharma, sir. yeah, that's what we were talking that it's mainly for the ptosis that we will be doing an ice pack test. Uh, it does not have any impact on the squint. For that, a new stigmat test is the uh, only way that we can uh, confirm. That, so. Right, sir. And the ice pack test should be done one eye at a time or simultaneously? One eye at a time. You will have a better record. If both eyes are involved, then you can see it will be. But I think you should take pictures along with pictures. Yes. 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 And now that's easy with the smartphones you have. So you can easily take a pre uh, ice pack and post ice pack picture. So. Yes, sir. This is a very common question that postgraduates ask that, you know, whenever we ask them to do an ice pack test, it's the both the ice packs that they put together. Actually, it should be individually. And then, like, so it takes four minutes minimum for doing two eyes. Right, sir. So now, um, like, if, Rami, sir, would you, if you wouldn't mind, could you just discuss about the... Uh, ocular muscle surgeries in thyroid eye disease. Uh, we understand, sir, this is a question. There's a request we are making from the last class. Uh, uh, somebody had asked a question about the same. So what happens is thyroid is, uh, uh, over time, the muscles become tight because of chronic inflammation. And we develop a lot of fibrosis. The patient will develop some kind of uh, incompetent strabismus. So uh, in thyroid eye disease, usually it is the tight medial rectus and the tight inferior rectus. So the kind of squint surgery that we perform is to make sure the patient gets uh, no diplopia in the primary position and in the down gaze. We cannot. We want the patient to have a diplopia, a diplopia free or a binocular field of vision, which is very good, at least in the primary gaze and the down gaze or the reading position. So usually we end up doing recessions in these uh, surgeries. Recession is the preferred surgery of choice. Uh, 
and many times we prefer to do adjustable surgeries in these cases the muscles being extremely tight uh, we have to be very careful about the kind of suture that we use because suppose we do an inferior rectus recession it is likely that we might get more uh, amount of recession that we have actually planned because the muscle is pretty tight and is going to pull so if you plan for maybe 4 mm of recession we might end up getting 6 mm of recession so many times people prefer using uh, non absorbable sutures for this and when we do the recessions uh, it depends on personal choice uh, most of us would like to use absorbable sutures but we have to plan and in such a way that the patient gets the best result we cannot assure them of an outcome of very good ocular movements in all directions of gaze our main objective is to give them good vision in the prime position and in the downward or the reading position of gaze so squint surgery is performed frequently in thyroid disease usually when the disease becomes very stable and the uh, eye uh, position has become very constant over a period of at least 6 months uh, right. shamas any uh, you must add sir. you have so much experience so basically i mean what you have said is uh, correct and the only thing that we need to also see is that many a time we may have to do bilateral infrarectus uh, weakening so when you are doing that there is a possibility that you may weaken the adductors so there will be a a pattern induced an exotropia and down gaze and since usually they are tight irs you may have to do larger amounts maybe more than 4.5 or 5 mm so one op- problem is that it may cre- create an a pattern exotropia in down gaze so you need to do a nasal shifting of the inferior rectus when you are recessing the other problem is because of the ir recession being more than 4.5 there is a risk of there is a uh, the drooping of the lower lid or retraction of the lower lid down so you will have a widening of the pelvic aperture because the lower lid is also retracted downwards so you have to do a good dissection of the inferior rectus from the uh, fascia of the uh, lower lid so that it doesn't happen there are even people who have described passing sutures pre uh, recession into the muscle so that you have a same relationship maintained and there are uh, people who have described doing a specialized surgery that you do not disinsert from the insertion but somewhere uh, in behind 5 mm behind and then you pass uh, uh, sutures which are separating the thing so that your attachment in the lower lid is not disturbed i have never done that particular surgery but yes we do take care of the lower lid at uh, fascia so that they are disconnected properly and sometimes the sutures have to be passed in the lower lid to be pulled it pulled up so that it doesn't create this so and the non absorbable sutures yes so this is a uh, real something which may be very useful in case of thyroid eye disease when you're doing ir recessions because progressive uh, over recession effect is seen in these cases uh, so one should be uh, maybe taking non absorbable 50 ethyl bond while doing the recession or especially when doing adjustable recessions in the ear right so i think uh, this was a question moreover requested by santosh nava sir and i think he wanted all of us to be hearing this part because we haven't seen the squint surgeries in thyroid eye disease so he made sure that he requests that uh, ramesh murthy sir to please address this question so uh, we covered that too uh, i think uh, ramesh sir again got uh, disconnected uh, yeah. so should we wait for him to reconnect if there are any questions yes the, or... the questions have been covered for now sir and uh, like however uh, like uh, the discussion for thyroid disease continues so if you would like me to wait yeah if there are any questions on thyroid disease particularly anything specifically has been asked so the question is that like how long after the uh, inactivity of the disease would you prefer to go ahead with the uh, squint surgeries if there is, the disease stay has stabilized then how long would you like to wait after which you can intervene for a squint surgery okay ramesh is back okay. so let me sorry sir. the question asked was how long is the intervening period between the activity of the disease and squint surgery in thyroid eye disease sir usually they say at least 6 months but i would always like to wait for longer time and then operate the patient sir also i'd like to highlight about the post reduction testing in these cases and other difficulty of the hooking the inferior rectus in these cases the muscle is extremely tight and we would be very cautious and carefully we should do others we might snap the muscle and we can have a lost muscle so we have to be very careful about the hooking of the muscles so the minimum period of waiting is at least 6 months and we try to find out what the problem the patient faces and then we try to solve the problem the practical problem of the patient 
because we cannot assure them of perfect uh, committed uh, movement of the eyes in all directions of gaze so we always try to find out what the problem is and try to help as you said if there is a reading problem and we do a large eye resection we end up in a pattern in reading becomes more difficult for them so we are very careful about what their uh, needs are and then we plan the surgery for the patient just Sir, in on the hooking of the empty rectus and passing sutures uh, another tip that we should be remembering is you should use a two hook technique so after you hook the inferior rectus you pass another hook and have both of them together and the groove between them you can pass the sutures uh, i mean of course if you have the covels uh, hook or uh, the specialized hook which have a platform with a groove then it's fine but if you don't have that you can use this two hook technique so that uh, the assistant is holding the other hook and you can pass the needle in between the groove between these two so that you do not pass the Uh, bites in the sclera because of these tight muscles you may be ending up having a bite in the sclera and uh, the same is true when you're uh, and then you should have a little more uh, uh, i mean uh, gap between the insertion and the passage of the uh, sutures because when you are going to disinsert you need to have a little bit of stump and uh, otherwise you might cause a perforation with the tight muscles there will be a little bit of tenting up of the sclera and you may perforate the sclera so that is another thing which you have to be careful about yeah with rolika carry on so in the uh, thyroiditis disease of, like sir has mentioned that inferior rectus would be the one which would be most like you know tightened out of all yeah. the muscles but which one is the first to be involved this is a question very often asked in the vivers too so the post graduates should know about that too that's the sequence of involvement of muscles would be what sir it is the inferior rectus right. inferior rectus is the first one to be involved to the inferior rectus then superior rectus then middle rectus sometimes maybe ims or i think ir sr mr and lateral rectus of these is the least and rarely even uh, they have described the superior oblique may be involved but generally this these are the four muscles recti which are involved right so uh, so another question is that in the 30 to 40 years age group Uh, most of the patients who have kind of as you said that they have resolved the inactivity has uh, taken like set in so they have chances of recurrence of disease in this age group so would you prefer a longer wait period in this age group before you go ahead for squint surgeries so i think we have to see the stability of the deviation so uh, one is the activity that will be seen from the point of uh, view of the uh, inflammatory signs which are there in thyroid disease second is that you see the deviations and maybe on a monthly or six weekly visit you would see the change which is occurring if you can see that they are now stable angles or deviations for at least two or three consecutive visits then you can uh, go ahead for surgery in the meantime yes you can give prisms maybe in some of these patients and if there is a larger deviation which cannot be corrected with prism then maybe you have to tell them to occlude the eye that your intervening period uh, i am not very happy with the botox but yes some people have used botox also in cases of thyroid disease i don't know what dr ramesh feels about using botox in thyroid botox disease. will uh, so botox will help only when the it is the earliest stage of the disease where possible yeah. early inflammation and once the fibrosis component sets in botox will not be of any use right so in the later stage of disease botox does not help right sir thank you so much uh, ramesh sir for covering the three topics uh, extensively and uh, as i say that mycena gravis is a very important topic it comes as long question short question and if you have covered this segment of your uh, uh, talk if you can put this across in one part of your answer then you have kind of uh, highlighted the most important part the examiner would look at it and understand that you have understood the topic for sure so you've covered management extensively so thanks a lot for that sir um, thank you pradeep sharma sir for the extensive discussion we all enjoy it as always and as i was saying that i think santosh unav has made sure that uh, ramesh sir covers the thyroid disease that was mostly for the fellows to listen so thank you so much sir and uh, yes sir so our next class would be on october 5th that would be on anomalies of convergence and divergence by dr amar pujari sir thank you rolika for conducting and moderating the session so nicely and dr ramesh in spite of your 
I think having uh, some problem with your health, you have taken up this uh, great thing and you have done ex excellent presentation. It was very succinctly covered, all the three topics, and it was really a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, thank you all for this audience. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your thank time. Thank you, Rolika. Thank you, Pradeep, sir, for your kind words. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Rolika, for conducting this. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.